I actually met Kirk at a, a conference in Manchester in the UK as part of an event put on by the Guardian newspaper. Hi, I'm Kirk Sorensen. They'd invited people to come and present their ideas, and Kirk was one of the ten people that presented. And I can remember sitting on the panel and just being kind of blown away by the fact that, that there was an alternative version of nuclear. I'm an environmentalist. My passion is kind of climate change and energy. I worked at Friends of the Earth, who, you know, a green campaign group in the UK, and I was an anti-nuclear campaigner. But I've become a politician. I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. That's changed my life quite a lot, so I'm still getting used to it, really. People call me my lady and the Baroness. But Sellafield Limited is actively working with the 600 people who are going to be losing their jobs at this time, and everybody in the area is doing their very best to see if these people can find jobs very quickly. Sellafield is a unique site in the UK, and I believe it could become the home of world-leading research into the use of next-generation nuclear reactors. Mm. Such reactors, as well as being more efficient in their fuel use, generating no long-lasting waste, can be designed to burn up the existing stockpiles of plutonium held at the Sellafield site. Despite greater acceptance of nuclear power, there remain concerns about nuclear waste. So, in light of this, is there more that the government can do to support R&D into new nuclear designs that will help to ensure we develop the safest and most efficient new reactors? Yeah. 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 The engineer looks at the world as hundreds of things that are, that are inefficient and then should be more properly designed. So when you tell an engineer that something's like 20% more efficient, it's like, yeah. You tell them it's like 50% more efficient, it's like, oh my gosh. Now imagine when you tell them it's hundreds of times more efficient. It becomes absolutely irresistible. Making solid nuclear fuel is a complicated and expensive process. And we extract less than 1% of the energy from the nuclear fuel before it can no longer remain in the reactor. The solid fuel will begin to swell and crack, and you begin to get this central void. This is actually a, a gap in the fuel. When the fuel swells to a certain point, the clad can't hold it anymore. And when the clad can't hold it anymore, it's time to remove the fuel from the reactor. At this point, only a small amount of the energy has been consumed. Wigner didn't like solid fuel. He was a chemical engineer by training, and he thought, what process do we run chemically based on solids? We don't. Everything we do, we use as liquids or gases because we can mix them completely. You can take a liquid, you can fully mix it. You can take a gas, you can fully mix it. You can't take a solid and fully mix it unless you turn it into a liquid or a gas. I believe part of this came from Wigner's educational background. He was the only person, or almost the only person, who combined a great skill as a nuclear physicist with great skill as an engineer. Wigner, of course, was a chemical engineer yes. by training. He was the only one who had, who, who commanded both of those mm -hmm. attributes. Mm -hmm. and so he was able to see both the engineering and physics aspects. He was a chemical engineer by training, and he knew that in chemical processes, the reactant streams are almost always liquids and gases. They're fluids. And in fluids, a completion of the various chemical reactions are possible. He looked at the nuclear problem and wondered if the same principle might not apply. And they began investigating some very, very radical nuclear reactors, totally different than the kind of stuff we have now. Wigner was not terribly successful in making converts in the nuclear community. But he did make one convert, this guy, Alvin Weinberg. He was his student during the Manhattan Project. And Weinberg got it. He got the big picture. We need liquid fuel. I see it. I see what we got to do. They were into small modular reactors before small modular reactors were cool. Small, liquid, poor, and then you have high efficiency. So there's a couple of things that jumped right out at us. The shielding weight became reasonable. All these great benefits, how do we know this can work? Quite simply, because, because we did it. I got in the car, I live in Alabama, and I was able to go up to Oak Ridge and, and talk to some of the people there. And I said, hey, I've heard that you guys a long time ago did this really, really cool thing. In the 1960s at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, we ran what was called the Molten Salt Reactor Experiment. This was the main focus of Oak Ridge for decades, and it was very abruptly cut off, and it was a very bitter pill to swallow for them. And so a lot of these great minds, they thought their life work had kind of gone to waste. Yeah, long time ago, we did a really, really cool thing, and everybody who did it's retired or dead now. I'm like, oh, well, that's not good. At the world's oldest molten salt website. If you find the original copy of the Generation 4 report, 
my URL for my website is listed as the only reference. I'm a guy in the garage. I should not be the only reference for this. The other thing is Alvin Weinberg wasn't dead yet. To list me while there's so many other documents, are you kidding me? I actually got an email from a guy named Richard Weinberg, who is the son of Alvin Weinberg. Well, are your father's papers somewhere? Have they been, you know, examined? And he said, most of my father's papers are at the Oak Ridge Children's Museum. And so I ended up going back to Oak Ridge. Literally, there was a big walk-in closet with filing cabinets stacked to the ceiling that nobody had looked at in, in decades, probably. I'm realizing as I go through these Oak Ridge documents how limited their distribution was. On the very last page of everyone, there's a distribution. There's about 40 people. And you're like, so best case scenario, 40 people read what I'm holding in my hand 50 years ago. And this is no little thing. This was a long research project starting from the 50s. A huge body of research Oak Ridge did. Unfortunately, only Oak Ridge, so it's geographically limited knowledge. There's hundreds of these big, big documents. At one time, this whole courtyard would have been full of thousands of specimens that we could do all kinds of research and testing on. Right. He said, but one day, nickel alloys were at a real premium, like right. unheard of yes. recycle value. And he said someone made the decision to come in. Mm-hmm. He said they cleaned out all of our lab specimens for recycle. Yuri Gat, a scientist at Oak Ridge, got me involved in molten salt. Walking through graphite reactor building, there's this large pallet covered with books, manuals. And I just, we kind of stopped. It was kind of in the way of our path. And there was a, uh, Yuri was there. He goes, oh, they didn't tell me again. And I just picked, reached down, picked them up. They were all um, big, thick documents uh, on the molten salt reactor. And I happened to pick two of the best I possibly could. The status report of the molten salt breeder reactor. The other was the project plan. I just randomly picked them up. And you're, the workman came and he said, hey, what are you doing here? And Yuri says, are you, what's going to happen to these documents? The guy goes, they're going to, um, the ex, these are the excess. They're going to the burn facility. They were burning them. It was a real shame probably in the 1990s that just needing more space and that so many documents started to be just destroyed or shredded. Hey, this would be great for a space reactor. We ought to throw some money at these guys and get all this stuff uh, documented. NASA was able to get Oak Ridge and like 10,000 bucks to scan in those documents. A really genuinely beautiful thing to like try and share knowledge. There was never a level of uptake for it at the, at the agency but amongst individuals, there were a lot of people that got very interested. And uh, we had uh, dug up that information from Oak Ridge National Labs and uh, thought it was great and kind of put together several uh, proposals based on it. It's been a lot better. A new policy is any old documents, if someone in the world is calling them, that makes it important enough to scan. And as we need them, they, they seem ready to be able to make electronic versions that, that the rest of the world can use. We have been able to access and also to disperse an amazing amount of information. This was the big problem was, how do you show this is real? You know, it sounds like made up technology when you describe it to people. Geez, the molten salt reactors pretty much does what fusion is asking. And we're almost developed to the stage we could start using them so long ago in the 50s, 60s and early 70s. Uh, you nuclear engineers are probably going to think those are, those are fuel rods. They're not. They're graphite. Uh, the fuel was a liquid that flowed through channels in this graphite. So uh, the graphite served as the function that water serves in an existing solid fueled reactor, which is, is, to, is to moderate the neutrons that are being born in fission. Except this time, instead of having solid fuel and a liquid moderator, you've got liquid fuel and a solid moderator. It's so opposite. They, they're, there they have solid fuel, liquid moderator, molten salt, Liquid fuel, solid moderator. Uh, Water, salt. Uh, uh, Graphite, no graphite in here. Metal in here, yeah, no metal in here. It's like an opposite reactor. Well, back around 2004, a gentleman named Kirk Sorensen had contacted me my email and came to visit us at Berkeley because we'd been working on molten salt reactor technology and doing some of the early studies of how salts might be used to cool solid fuel reactors. 
and Kirk came into my office, he had a stack of CD-ROMs, and on them was this compendium of reports from Oak Ridge National Laboratory from the molten salt reactor program of the 1950s through 1970s. And that was a treasure trove. There was an enormous amount of very useful data that he discovered a treasure trove. This, this, was, this was going to change the world. Uh, when I was at NASA, I finagled some funds to get those documents scanned. I made bunches and bunches of copies of CDs. For all you young people, this is almost like kind of pre-internet. Yeah, we had it, but you know, your website would hold about 20 megabytes. So CDs were the only way to really move around big data. S sneaker net was probably the better way to describe it. So I made these for the Secretary of Energy and delivered them in, in DC and I sent them to lab directors. Sent it all out to these different places. Just sure that, you know, they were gonna get CDs from a random person and put them in their computer and study them extensively, all five gigabytes of them, and come to the same conclusion I had and change national policy. I mean, of course, right? Nobody cared at all. The only person who cared was Pear. And, and I'm really, really glad he did because I think he feels the same way about this technology that I do, that it's really exciting. I mean, I spent a number of years when I first learned about this just asking people, okay, tell me what's wrong with this. Tell me why it's not the greatest thing since sliced bread because Really, you know, I, I'm not a, I wasn't a nuclear engineer back then. I didn't want to get involved if it wasn't important. And I wanted somebody to come and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we did this and this and this, and it totally did not work out. And that would have been simple. So then I'd be like, hey, fine, I'll go back to doing my space things. But the fact that they didn't say that, and they said that this was a great idea, we really should have done it, that stuck in my, that stuck in my craw for a long time. You know, I, I would wonder, Joe Bonametti and I would talk to each other at NASA, and it, it, it almost tormented us, I think it really did literally torment Joe, that uh, we weren't working on what we felt like was the most important thing. It would be a fantastic uh, um, help to the human race in general, and it could be also what lends us uh, quite well into, into space reactors and, and uh, going to Mars, going to the moon and other places. Um, you need that light, small power source.